I um, I don't know whether it's possible to cultivate a style. Nobody is precisely what they think they are. Love mm -hmm. is where you find it, where you find it, where you find it. Love mm -hmm. is where you find it. <clears throat> Maybe in the last moments of my life, moments of my life, I will be curious to know what it means to die. Welcome to Folk Phenomenology. My name is Sam Rocha. This is episode zero of season one, featuring special guest host, Sophia Rocha. Today's episode was originally recorded on May 27th, 2021. Folk Phenomenology is sponsored by Whip and Stock Publishers, who published my 2015 book, Folk Phenomenology, Education, Study, and the Human Person. Also sponsoring Folk Phenomenology is Give Us a Stay, Daily Prayer for Today's Catholic, and the Institute for Christian Socialism, Building a Movement of the Ecumenical Christian Left. Folk Phenomenology is also sponsored by Solidarity Hall, Eden plus Utopia, and Revelation Cable Company, Vancouver Custom Cables and Pedalboard Solutions. Folk Phenomenology is also sponsored by Black Catholic Messenger, an online publication for black Catholics. And where Peter is, there is the church. Folk Phenomenology is also sponsored by the Juan Diego Network, Catholic Audio for Latinos, and finally, Commonweal Magazine, the leading lay Catholic voice for commentary on religion, politics, and culture. Please look to the show notes to find uh, all the links to all these wonderful and generous sponsors. Today's featured sponsor is Jeannie Gaffigan on behalf of the Imagine Society. The Imagine Society is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to connecting youth and adult community service groups with projects that improve society. You can also find their link in the show notes and at theimaginesociety.org. If you would like to support Folk Phenomenology, please share this episode subscribe to the show on your favorite app or platform, and maybe even leave a nice review, or if you'd like, a tip. We're just getting started. In some sense, we haven't even gotten started officially. So all of your help, all of the sharing on social media, all of the, I suppose, volume boosting uh, you can offer to the show, whether it's public or whether it's notifying your friends or family, um, all of that is just really, really appreciated. The motto for the show is Dilexit Mundum. D-I-L-E-X-I-T M-U-N-D-U-M. It's a Latin phrase, it's a Latin expression that I took and modified from John 3.16 of the Vulgate of Jerome's Bible. And it means love the world, but it means love the world in a specific sense of delight. It means to delight in the world. And today's episode, which is kind of this preface, this foreword uh, to this season one, and to this debut that, that officially launches next week. This episode is truly a delight for me to share, mainly because the guest host is my daughter, Sophia, who is age seven and is truly uh, one of the greatest delights in my world and in my life. So to be able to begin the show First and foremost, as a father speaking to uh, my daughter, to Sophia, and allowing her to, in many ways, do my job and to interview me and to pose questions which she prepared for our conversations. And I suspect she also prepared uh, with some help from her mother. Um, it's just really special and it's a great delight to uh, begin this show by sharing this interview with you. Hi, I am 
Sophia Rocha. Today I'm going to be interviewing my dad, Sam Rocha. Welcome to Folk Phenomenology. Thanks, Sophia. I have some questions I'm going to say to you. Okay, go ahead. What is Folk Phenomenology? Hmm. Well, it's a title for my new podcast. Is that Ooh. what you mean? Yep. Anything else? Um, there's why are there field recordings? Why are there field recordings in my in my podcast? Um, in Folk Phenomenology. Oh, my podcast titled Folk Phenomenology. Yeah. I gotcha. Well, how do you know about the field recordings? Well, actually, you might have seen me field recording this year. That's right. You went out to do the field recordings. That's where we got the whole idea to do this interview, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And why did you... And um, how long does it take to write your books? Wow. You're moving very quickly through this interview. Um, do you mean to say that folk phenomenology, beyond being the title for this podcast, also was the title for one of my books that came out? I didn't know that. How long did it take? Well, that book, I started writing it before you were born, whenever we lived in Ohio, in Columbus, where Gabe was born, Mm -hmm. your brother. And I first wrote it as my dissertation, which is kind of like a long uh, book. And then I edited it for a long time. So I think probably from it came out in 2015. So when you were two years old Hmm. I think it came out and that means that that book took me uh, maybe six years to write so it's a so I'm a year older than the book because I am seven seven yeah and um basically this is who am is Sam Rocha so this is basically who is um who are you who am I yeah basically Basically, yeah, because the two is Sam Rocha, and that's you. So. Fair enough. Um, well, I'm your dad. Mm-hmm. And what do you do? Um, oh, do you mean like being a teacher at UBC? Mm-hmm. And other things. Sure. I also am a musician. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I play guitar. At the Wolf and Hound. <laughs> yeah, I play a lot at the Wolf and Hound. That's where my trio plays. Mm-hmm. You've been there before, yeah. haven't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you dance a lot to the, to the music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what else? Um, anything I miss there? Is there, um, how about you talk about maybe philosophy a bit more? That's of true. Like your teaching. That's a good idea. So I teach philosophy of education. Mm-hmm. In the faculty of education. And what does philosophy... And um, the next question I have is, why are you using guitar for folk phenomenology? Like, why are you using it besides like other instruments like violin and piano and other things? Like that? Sure. Well, I don't play violin or piano. Well, mommy plays piano that's sometimes. true that is true your mommy does play piano um well i'm playing guitar mainly because that's the instrument that i love the most and that i've played for the longest time and you know the most and i definitely know the most about it and and i feel like so we're talking here and we're recording and whenever we're finished recording I will save this, uh, these tracks of sound that we've recorded and I will listen to them and while I listen to them I'll play guitar and I'll try to kind of play guitar in a way where I express whatever I hear and what, kind of, you're, and what we're all saying. Yeah, I mean in some sense what I'll end up saying, what I'll be, do, end up doing is just playing guitar about kind of the way it makes me feel to listen to what is being said and also remembering what it was like to talk to you and to talk to all the other people that I talked to um, on this podcast. Um, I know that you um, play um, the drums a little bit and um, 
I'm wondering why you cannot um, use that because that's basically the only instrument you use besides guitar. That's true. Uh, I actually changed my mind recently. And so there's field recordings that I've used, mm -hmm. um, including some of your voice mm -hmm. and some spots mm -hmm. that I used where you say folk phenomenology in the forest. Mm -hmm. Folk phenomenology. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and now we're on it. Yeah, and exactly. And that's actually how you got the idea for me to interview you. That is, that is where I got the idea. But one thing I decided was actually that um, I think the drums would sound pretty good. But instead of recording drums every single time, I'm going to do one, kind of like I did one soundtrack from the field recordings, I'm going to do one drum track. Mm -hmm. And then that'll kind of help guide my guitar so I'm not just listening to the interviews, I'm also kind of feeling the sounds from the forest and some of the rhythms and the beats from the drums. So you're kind of like feeling like in this office, which is not outside and kind of like, um, like hot and you know, not the same as like cool air outside and just having that is like you're outside. That's a good point. Nature. Yeah. So in some ways, um, there will be an inside sound and an outside sound. Um, and then I'll play guitar, of course, inside uh, again. Uh, in between those inside and outside sounds. I like that, yeah. And maybe, um, I've actually heard that you can actually like um, play guitar outside sometimes. Maybe sometime you could like use that for your guitar and like have like a field recording and guitar at the same time. That That's true. You know, idea. whenever the book came out in 2015, uh, one of the things I did is I recorded an album uh, called Fear and Loving. The very first track was called Folk Phenomenology. Your brother at the time was young, but he read a piece from the book for that. And in that case, I played the guitar outside or in kind of like open areas like stairwells and stuff for all uh -huh. of that. And like, um, like sometimes some buildings have like stairs and there's like some sitting plots. Places like um, in UBC by the net, there's like those stairs. Yeah, totally. No, we played um, we played by some stairs at a parking lot at UBC, but yeah, those are all good spaces. I remember that. Actually, remember I went to like that big like place tent. I think of it or something. Like that big tent, black oh, tent. Oh, when we had a gig at UBC. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was you that could. it? Uh, not the same place, but uh, yeah, that was another time where we played outside. Although that was on a really big stage with a lot of uh, a lot people of equipment and, and a lot of people and food, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it was definitely outside. Yeah. At a fair, basically, or a picnic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. Like a church picnic. Or yeah. A Good. Do you have any other um, questions? Um, I have a question. Where were we? Where were we? Just um, and why? Um, how many people are there usually in your classes? Oh, good question. Well, uh, I think the average usually is like 20. Sometimes I have small classes. Like 10 or not? Mm -hmm, like 10 or 12. Uh, and then sometimes I've had some kind of big classes. Um, like 40 or 40 or 50. Yeah. There's a class I teach sometimes um, where I've taught it with like a hundred or just over a hundred students in it. And those are those are the biggest classes I teach. Some people though at UBC teach classes with like three and five hundred people. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a lot. And how do you feel when people don't like your classes? Mm. Well, I don't always find out, but whenever I do, as you read it in their course evaluation, at the end of the classes, they get to write kind of notes about what they liked and what they didn't like. And uh, I mean, if they're fair and if they say things that they didn't like, then I try to uh, kind of like make up for your sake and fix, like, like fix, like if someone doesn't like what, like one of your um, drawings, and they can kind of like fix that little part. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, if someone says, like, you know, whenever you write words on the board, we can't read them because your handwriting is bad, I'll... And then I can, like, practice your handwriting. Exactly. I'll practice on having better handwriting. But sometimes, Sophia, sometimes people say things that I feel like aren't very fair or aren't very nice. And then, in those cases, I don't want to fix anything. I just kind of just feel sad. Hmm. And what do you 
do when you aren't working? Um, well, we have Lucius now. Yeah, our, so we kind of take him on the walks, and we also watch movies sometimes. Yeah, so we take Lucius on walks, we watch movies. Eat I also lunch, yeah. eat watch lunch, football. watch football during football season. I love to go fishing. Mm -hmm. and, and we're go and we've already got a reservation for Tunkwa. Yeah, Tunkwa Lake, where we go in the summer, and I think tomorrow we're gonna go fishing on the ocean at mm -hmm. low tide. That's uh, my favorite. I know we love Are we that. We're gonna bring Lucius. We'll bring Lucius, and we'll get, bring some crab traps. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll find more. And may, and this time bring your iPad because last time someone forgot their iPad and we and we found two crabs. I know. Well, I found two. I crabs. know. My iPad has my license on it. What I actually did, Sophia, is I went and printed off my license so I can carry it in my pocket in a little Ziploc bag. Hmm. So, so we'll now we'll always have it. Yeah. Good. And where were we? Um, what is folk What is phenomenology? Just plain. Just plain. So you mean like just the word? Yeah. So the word phenomenology, you have to break it up into two chunks. There's phenomena and ology. Ology. Yeah. And so phenomenon or phenom, uh, phenomena uh, means uh, a thing that appears. So it's an appearance. Um, and then ology is kind of like the study of something. And so when you put them together... Uh, words like phenomenology, usually you put the back part first. So it's like the study of things that appear or the study and of appearances. Now, since we kind of learned about the phenomenology part, once if we add the folk part. Yeah. So the folk part is interesting. Um, can I tell you a story? Okay. All right. Have you ever heard of Louis Armstrong? Mm -mm. Okay. Louis Armstrong was a trumpet player and a singer. It's one of my favorite uh, jazz musicians. And he was once asked a long time ago uh, to tell the, uh, the journalist what kind of music he played. And Louis Armstrong said, I play folk music. And the journalist said, why, why do you say that? What, what do you mean? And Louis Armstrong said, well, I play music for folk. For people. For people. So folk means people. Um, and it also gives a sense of, uh, a, a folk is like, it's never as, uh, just one person. It's always kind of a group of people. Like kind of like an audience? Yeah, kind of like an audience or just like a, a crowd or, or, a, or a bunch of people. Um, and so folk or like a team of people. Yeah, exactly. Like a team of like two or like ten or... A, a, a not big number because yeah. teams are very big they're only like a 20 or 10 or at least 20. yeah so if you put the two words together then it's the I, folk phenomenology kind of means the study of things that appear for people and that can mean kind of two things it can mean the study of things that appear like the study for people so studying things that appear for some people to watch and observe or, or listen to but it can also mean the study of the things that appear sort of like to people that people kind of can see and feel and stuff. And so a lot of the podcast here is going to be talking to people about um, what they think about things. Mm -hmm. And I guess a question that just came up, it was, um, what does phenomenology, folk phenomenology, phenomenology, well, folk phenomenology and um, phenomenology mean to you? Just play. Or... Any way, in oh. any way, or all the ways you can tell. Okay. Um, what does it mean to me? Yeah. That's kind of a good question because sometimes when I talk about things, I talk about like, what do the words say? And sometimes I talk about, you know, um, yeah. So what does it mean to me? Um, that's a special question. I guess for me, um, in terms of the podcast, it means that. Well, I guess if I go back, sorry, I'm not giving you a very good answer. Whenever, whenever I started doing this work at Ohio State, I don't think I really knew what it would be, but I kind of wanted it to be something that everyone or most people could maybe understand. And I don't know if I did a very good job. 
because I had to write it for, you know, for my, my teachers, the mm -hmm. people who were teaching me. And they were all really smart. And so I kind of wanted them to to like it and to think it was smart. And to see was something like new because they knew a lot so it would be challenging. Yeah, to see yeah. something new. Yeah, probably that too. I wanted to kind of make folk phenomenology like this very new and special thing. But now, you know, it's been a long time since that time. And even the book, I think, you know, when it came out, it was different. And so now doing the podcast, it's kind of like what that means to me is that maybe I can try and maybe I can do better at sharing this with more people and with lots of people. And, uh, and in this case, I'm not even going to write anything. I'm just going to talk the way we're talking now and then mm -hmm. record and, and play some music. Mm -hmm. And I had another question. Okay. basically based off of the last question. Um, so I'm just going down the question and saying, what does it mean to you? Yeah. And, what, and the next question I probably said a long time ago is, um, what do field recordings mean to you? Oh, that's interesting. So field recordings are recordings that you do in a field, and the in the field we did our recordings in, where it was in the forest, like a forest field, like um with moss and great children. Yeah, and ferns, and you know we have beautiful, huge forests here. Um, mm -hmm. So, but what that means to me is kind of like what you said about the inside and the outside. Mm -hmm. um, I like to think of also folk phenomenology being about. Um, insides and outsides and that includes indoors and outdoors mm -hmm. um and it also includes the inside of people like their heart mm -hmm. and the outside uh, like the the things they see it could mean like the the, the sky and uh, the stars and it could also mean you know um your tummy or something like that so to me the field recording gives a sense of the sky and it gives a sense of being outside and the sounds that come with that and the feeling that it that it makes to your ears and, and to to your um to how you feel when you hear those kinds of sounds and what do your books mean to you like any of your books or all of them you can do mm. yeah well they're things i make so I like to make books, I like to make albums, I like to make music. Uh, and they have to be something that you like or else you shouldn't make them. Yeah, they have to be something you like. Yeah, they have to be something I like um, or they have to be about things I like. Otherwise, you know, they're, it's too much work to make it's something boring, that you don't like. kind of like, it's nothing that you really like. Yeah, yeah. So I guess my books are things I like. Although sometimes I don't like all my books all the time because... Sometimes I change my mind. So there's some books that I read now and I think maybe a bit differently than I did then before. But at least people can read it and know what I thought at the time when I wrote it. Um, and, okay, I'm going to get back to our other questions. Um, actually, I think I know I, I can make there be more questions. Okay, what, do, what does guitar music mean to you? Well, guitar music is really special to me because it's one of the earliest things I remember. My dad played guitar, your grandpa, Poppy, mm -hmm. um, and he had a guitar that had stickers on it. Stickers on it? Yeah, it had, it had these stickers on it. Was um, it was, were they like stickers that I got from different places or just random stickers that they got like off from there? No, they were like, they were stickers that said like, Jesus is Lord and... Uh, Maybe Other one of them had like a dove on it for like the Holy Spirit. So kind of like church stickers? Yeah, definitely church stickers. Because my dad played guitar at like prayer meetings mm -hmm. and at church. And you can sometimes play guitar for the church and yeah. drums. Yeah, so whenever I was young though, I played guitar at church. I only played guitar at church for, you know, oh gosh, you know, almost. For I mean, long, I still for do. For basically like your entire childhood. Like for a long time. Yeah, for like 15 years. <laughs> um, so so guitar music is is for me about church a and lot. It's kind of like family. And family, it's about my dad. And it gives you like memories of your family and other things. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, music was a huge part of, uh, uh, of our life. And 
you know, it, it, now you can see that I, I still play guitar a lot. So, you know, but but I also learned a lot from people who played guitar. And I didn't listen to a lot of music whenever I was very young, but I got to listen to a lot of guitar players. And whenever I found a guitar player who I really liked at church, usually I would ask them questions. Um, and then when I got older and I would listen to music, you know, like some guitar players like Don Ross or Pat Metheny or, or John Schofield. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, I, I can't really ask them questions cause, because I'm just listening to them, but I imagine sometimes, uh, myself asking them questions. Uh, my, my favorite guitar player to listen to right now, his name is Julian Lodge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's fantastic. And, um, I just got a question. It's, um, how do you let all your emotions and feelings when you play guitar or music or hear something? Ooh. Well, I, I have lots of them whenever I hear music, I mean... Or, like, play music. Yeah, yeah. Or do you sing? Sure. You know, sometimes when I play music, and I have the most feelings, I almost feel like I'm asleep in a dream. Like a wonderful dream? Yeah, it's kind of wonderful, but it's also almost like, I don't know, like, uh... It's almost like, like I'm not in the place where I am. Like I'm almost like, like I flew somewhere or something like, like that. Like you flew into a crowd, clouds and you're like um, in the cloud playing guitar. Yeah, it's a funny feeling. It's a feeling that I don't know if I get um, in many other places, but it's a feeling like, like you left the place you're in and you're kind of like, like you're transported somewhere. Uh, sometimes books, reading a really good story can make me feel that way, but in that case, I end up inside the story. With music, it's like, I don't really know where I am, but it's great, yeah. And I guess, I guess I'm on my board to see a question. Um, um, what are, like, your classes to you, like, your classes? My classes? Uh, they're kind of like experiments. Hmm, how like science experiments like you're like you're guess like you're seeing if like your teacher likes what you did like your book or a lot of times I feel like I'm just trying to see if my students like what I do um, sometimes I'm trying to see if I like what I do um, sometimes if I give like a lecture or I talk about a book I try to talk about it in maybe a different way or try to read the book in a new way than I have before and sometimes there are books that I've read like maybe nine or 10 or 12 or sometimes like 20 times. And so that's always a challenge. Um, so yeah, classes for me are kind of like experiments. And that means sometimes they're exciting, especially when there's surprises, but then sometimes it also means sometimes they don't work. Mm -hmm. And get some, get back to our question. Okay. I, were we on this one? What? Do you want people to learn from you? Where do we already do that one? No, that's a good question. Oh, I mean, I'm kind of gonna learn. I learned a lot recording all the interviews. So, what uh, do you like? Um, want your um, like the people you teach you and the people that you know and the people that you like listen to your lectures and debates and. Every, and like everybody who knows you or has seen you in their life and kind of, yeah. What do I want them to, to learn? Yeah, like when you die, what do you want them to like carry on from you? Whoa. Like learn from you. Sure. Or uh, when you're still alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Kind of like um, after when they will like carry on your, you know in the things that they sh that you should know. Yeah. How I like it. Um, that's a hard question. I don't, I mean, I, I guess probably... You can get to a really easy one, then maybe, like, another time you can, like, say that. Yeah, maybe. Like, I'd... maybe you can, like, put it on Facebook when you have it. <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I probably have to think about that longer. I think I want the most of all people to learn uh, that that love is important. 
that's probably the most important thing. Okay, and um, what is philosophy? Cool, philosophy. Well, interestingly, philosophy, the word can be said to, to mean love of wisdom. It has uh, roots in, in the Greek language. Uh, so loving wisdom is like, you know, being in love with learning new things in some ways. But I kind of think philosophy is not so much about l wanting to learn new things, but it's more about kind of like you said about the ask me about the feelings I get when I play music. Mm -hmm. I mean, one way you could say is that philosophy is about the feelings you get whenever you think. Uh, so it's like about wonder. Uh, kind of like your imagination? Yeah, it's definitely about your imagination. Yeah, I think for sure it's about that. But I think it's about using your imagination or your imagination kind of using you to have feelings that are... And like your brain showing you like different feelings that you have. Yeah, yeah, your brain, your heart, your hand. And your soul. Your soul, yeah, all of it, all of it together. And I think that like philosophy is 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 kind of about chasing after putting all those things kind of together for the same experience, which is something like uh, like maybe what I talked about with music. The funny thing for me is that I I, I probably have that feeling and that experience more with music than I do with philosophy mm -hmm. but I kind of chase after it there anyway mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. and I also have um what is what is philosophy to to you well I thought it what is philosophy to you? Can't really read mommy's handwriting. That's okay. Mm, I think that what I just said, it, philosophy is to me, it's it's trying to to have those feelings. I mean, I, it's also other things though. I mean, sometimes for me, philosophy is less about all those feelings and stuff, and it's about using my words really carefully and making sure that the way I use my words is clear and that um, people can ask me questions uh, after they hear the words I use and that the questions that they ask, uh, that I can answer them. And in some cases, if I need to, I can change them. So philosophy is also, I think, about uh, how we use our words and how we talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have one last question. Okay. It is um, one that I don't remember writing down. I think mommy recommended it. Okay. It is what? I think we might have had the wrong question. It said, what is a good snack to eat while watching folk phenomenology? <laughs> <laughs> A good snack to eat while listening to folk phenomenology? Or watching. Or watching, I guess. Okay. Um, I think it might be chocolate chip cookie or with the milk or something. Chocolate chip cookies with milk sound good. Or double chocolate? I like chocolate chip cookies with almonds. Mm. And maybe oatmeal. Mm. Yeah. Those well, are we good. made some chocolate chip oatmeal muffins this morning. You did make those. Those were very good. Mm -hmm. I, I think probably maybe I would... Huh. So folk phenomenology is going to have like music and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't have popcorn or chips because that'll be too loud in your ears and you won't be able to hear very well. So maybe uh, something that you can chew like, uh, quietly. Like um, a very like soft cookie. Yeah. Like a soft cookie. Yeah, a soft cookie. That sounds good. Soft cookies. Or like uh, those muffins were really soft and they came really That's crunch. true. Maybe some ice cream. Yeah, ice cream. Yes. But it needs to thaw for a bit because sometimes it can be really not crunchy. Sure. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. And I think that's all the questions for today. Well, thank you for interviewing me, Sophia. Mm-hmm. You're a great interviewer. Are there any things you want to say to the listeners of Folk Phenomenology? Well, I want to say have a happy weekend. Week. I guess it's not the weekend. The weekend that gets over. That's okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm.
Thank you for listening to this episode of Folk Phenomenology Season 1. And special thanks to Sofia Rocha, our special guest host today. Didn't she do a great job? I would like to again thank my sponsors, beginning with the special sponsor for this episode, Jeannie Gaffigan, on behalf of the Imagine Society, a youth-led charity organization. You can find the Imagine Society online at theimaginesociety.org. I'd also like to thank uh, all my sponsors, Whip and Stock Publishers, Give Us a Stay, the Institute for Christian Socialism, Solidarity Hall, Revelation Cable Company, Black Catholic Messenger, Where Peter Is, The Juan Diego Network, and Commonweal Magazine. The show also has, uh, well, is lucky to count uh, a number of friends uh, alongside its official sponsors. Um, the friends are people, first and foremost, who have been making content, um, creating media that I listen to, that I like, that I want to support, and that together with the sponsors and of course with all of you, um, build something of a real community and show that this work is not uh, done without solidarity and conviviality. And so the friends of the show are the Commonweal Podcast, the Gloria Purvis Show, Disinherited Podcast, Davud Gosley, Up Too Late with Teresa Zoe Williams, Conversation on Tap, Saintly Witnesses, Kinder Conservative, The Show, Gregory B. Sadler, and Cush Classics. Please make sure to check out the show notes for links uh, to all of these great friends of the show and also to all the wonderful sponsors. And I would like to highlight one of the friends of the show, given that this is kind of a seed planting um, episode, a prequel. The show, which was once called The Show with Edmund Mitchell, um, began quite a few years ago, and it's a really impressive work of both content and especially form and production, which includes video, which I can't even imagine doing at this point, this very early point. But um, Edmund, uh, at the very beginning of his show, had me on for two episodes, two very long episodes. Um, And not only his invitation, but also the conversation surrounding um, those episodes and getting to know Edmund, he really planted the seed for this show, I would say, and for me podcasting and doing this work. And it took a really long time for me to act on it, but I just want to give him a lot of credit and really thank him for his support of me and my work uh, over, over the years. You'll also find in the show notes a tip jar. I'm not running a Patreon, and I am really, really blessed and, and, and just really excited uh, to say that because of the sponsors of the show... I have covered both the modest budget, which is primarily uh, providing honoraria for my guests, and uh, also providing the technical software hosting and and production uh, needs. And um, so I'm I'm in the the enviable position of being able to uh, release the show uh, without any real outstanding, outstanding debts other than, well, my time. And and that's not something I'm too concerned about, but, um, all tips that I do get, uh, will be, uh, set aside for what I hope to be season two. And it might seem ridiculous to start fundraising for season two before season one even rolls out. But, uh, since I pre-recorded everything, I basically know the content and I feel, not only excited to share it with you, but also confident that it's a worthwhile endeavor to begin planning, uh, uh, planning and charting the course towards season two. So any tips that go into there, I will set aside and hopefully uh, be able to getting, uh, get to work on that as soon as we're done rolling this one out. Please, please, please share this episode. Uh, subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or platform. Uh, review the show if if you would Uh, all of those things are so important for the metrics and for uh, getting us out on on a strong uh, strong opening on the right foot 
Uh, Next week is going to be a monologue show, so it's going to be me on my own talking about the interview and how I understand the interview and what I um, am see myself as doing across this season in terms of the interviews that are really the heart and soul of the show. So be sure to tune in and be sure to um, to share that as well. Then in the following week, we get started with uh, Jeannie Gaffigan uh, in interview. Folk Phenomenology is written, hosted, recorded, and produced by me, Sam Rocha. The motto for the show is Dilexit Mundum, which is taken from the Vulgate of the Gospel of John. And Dilexit Mundum means love the world, but it means it in the sense of delect or delight. So it's a sense of love that's not just desire, but it's delight. And so in that sense, I exhort and encourage all of you to go out and love the world. Dilexi Mundu. What is interesting to me, really interesting, and I can't define it, is because it's interesting. I can't say exactly what it is, but it's the most interesting out of the word, concept, idea. My job is to somehow make them curious enough or persuade them by hook or crook to get more aware of themselves and where they came from and what they are into and what is already there and just to bring it out. This is what compels me to compel them. And I will do it by whatever means necessary. Love mm-hmm. is where you find it. This mm-hmm. is where you find it. Mm-hmm. This is where you find it. Love mm-hmm. is where you find it. And you don't know where it will carry you. And it is a terrifying thing. Love is the only human possibility, but it's terrifying. Through the eyes of our ears, we see the beauty of hope. We see the beauty of pain. We see the beauty 